welcome to today's episode of Group Therapy Podcast. Today we have Gary J. Tunnicliffe. Um, you may not know him, but you know him because he's been in everything. Oh, or worked on I've everything. I've been in everything. I've worked on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, you, you've done how many Hellraiser movies now? Um, eight. Eight Hellraiser films. I mean, he started off as a maker of Vexed Artists. Hellraiser 3 was making the boxes and was a workshop supervisor. And then on Hellraiser 4, I took over as the designer uh, and doing the makeup. And then over the years, became everything from um, prop creation to second unit direction, acting at various roles in various Hellraisers, whether it was uh, Bounce Cenobite or Spike Cenobite or an interviewer, like in Dead. If you watch Dead or I'm an interviewer at the very beginning of the Sorry, we're up. And then um, graduated to writing and directing Hellraiser Judgment, uh, the last of the Dimension Hellraisers before the rights went off to uh, the new company who just made the, uh, you know, yeah, the, the movie. movie. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, a lot of Hellraisers and then a lot of Dimension horror films, uh, a lot of sequels, uh, Feast movies, uh, Collector movies, uh, two Halloween, so I was in a Halloween, I got killed, uh, My Bloody Valentine, Blade, Mixed uh, Sleeping Hollow. Dracula 2000, Dracula Central, Dracula Legacy, which I was in. Um, scary movie for, I mean, my, my resume sounds like football, of course. Yeah, you know what I mean? I don't have a long resume, I have a wide resume. <laughs> it's like Hellraiser 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, Candyman 1, 3, Children of God 2, 4, you know, <laughs> Halloween 6, whatever, I don't know, 8, you know, uh, 3, 6, 1, you know, it's, yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, too much shit. Too much shit. And what you got you started in, in the business? Um, <coughs> well, I came from a very rural town in England where hopes and dreams of working in the film industry are a bit like hopes and dreams of being an astronaut. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just not going to happen. So I wanted to be an actor at first, and that wasn't going to happen. I was a singer in a band. Um, and one day, uh, some, and I always loved horror films. I always loved horror films. Um, you know, watching the Hammer horror movies, oh, yeah. and that stuff. And uh, sneaking into the cinema when I shouldn't be to go and see horror films. And somebody gave me a copy of Fangoria magazine, and I saw Fangoria, but what I saw not only were films, but makeup of Vexar, just guys in heavy metal t shirts with long hair, sculpting creatures like Norman Cabrera and people like that. I yeah. thought, hey, that, that looks like a cool job. And I um, literally went home, grabbed a bag of clay, and started, and found that I had a natural knack for it. And then became obsessed with it, just utterly obsessed. Within weeks, um, you know, of, of knowing nothing about makeup effects, oh, yeah. and my buddy and I was, like, I was like, "Do you have any of these fat warriors?" He's like, "Yeah, I've got a hundred of them." So I literally read a hundred of them in like two days, and then you know, suddenly Rob Bottin and Rick Baker and Tom Savini and Greg Cannon and names like that were just in my lexicon. And, uh, yeah, it was off to the races. You know, aged 16, 15, 16, and then saw Hellraiser and it just blew my mind. Yeah. I literally sat in a cinema in Canada in England and looked up and saw Pinhead and said, who did that? How did they do it? I want to do that. And that was my, that was my agenda. That, that, was, that was one of the ones that caught me. I, I legitimately, I was 14 when Hellraiser dropped. Uh, me and my, my cousin went to a local little theater that happened to have it. Right. And we were just like, well, what did we just watch? Yeah. And, and you're just then, then I'm hooked, you know. I mean, I started reading Clyde Barker. I'd read Damnation Game and uh, The Books of Blood. Mm. Um, so I knew what I was kind of in for. But uh, yeah, I think um, I think we'd all had enough of kind of a silent stalking killer. And suddenly yeah. he was a very kind of romantic, uh, you know, Shakespearean kind of bad guy. You know, if he's a bad guy, if you want to call Because after all, he's a demon to some. And yet yeah. an angel to others. So, uh, and I thought that was interesting. Suddenly, uh, you know, I wasn't scared of Pithead. I was more uh, intrigued. And what I liked about Horace was he left the cinema asking questions like, who was that guy? Why does he look like that? Was he human? What was the deal? You know, you wanted to know more. Yeah. Rather than, you know. Uh, yeah, so. okay, next movie. Yeah. Well, I, you know, look, I, I understand Leatherface and Michael and Jason, and I think they, you know, as is seen by the massive consumption by the public, that they are very valid, but I think um, they're a bit of a blunt instrument. You know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of social comment with, uh, I, I, with those characters. I think it's a shame that the Hellraiser movies didn't explore that further, you know. I thought maybe they will in the new ones, I don't know, but, um, you know, that's what always interested me, the order of the gash and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah. There's, the, 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 one, the one that's bothered me is that I, the one that I don't think we'll ever get is the Scarlet Gospel. No, prob- no, probably not, absolutely. Because that's what the only one that uh, said he'd come back for? Oh, no. Uh, look, I, I've got lots of people. I'm sure if you dangle a paycheck with any worth, it'll be Bradley Alterna. 
Sooner or later, you got to Someone has to change it up eventually, you know. You know and uh, it's interesting. Paul did, I think, with the character, and it'll be interesting to see with what uh, Jamie did with the character. I don't think it was interesting what Stephen Smith did with the character. <laughs> but, uh, now, as you can probably tell, I'm not backwards about coming forward. No, 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 no. Uh, when I talked to Mike yesterday, Mike's like, he goes, let Gary talk. He goes, he, he, he has no qualms about burning bridges today. <laughs> no, I will torch every fucking thing. Because <laughs> you are semi-retired. Yeah, 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 yeah. And let me tell you, right now, I'm being restrained. <laughs> I am being restrained. There were things I wanted to just say, but I didn't. So, uh-huh. I'm being very nice at the moment. <laughs> oh, man. Well, okay. okay. I, I do got to ask you one thing. Yeah, I ask you, as soon, soon, soon as I find out... Bitch, absolute bitch to work with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hated her, you know, as well. <laughs> Johnny Depp, loveliest guy in the world. <laughs> And, you know, and I was proved correct when they when I worked with him years ago and worked with her and said that when they got married and I was like she's a terrible person in my opinion and Johnny's a lovely person in my opinion everyone was like how, how dare you she's you know he's an abuse he's an abuser and she's an abused person and I was like time will time. see and guess who was proved right so justice for Johnny yeah we we had this whole discussion similar to that. <laughs> <laughs> about people because everybody likes to throw the, the, like the guy gets tend to get thrown under the bus big time when it comes to certain things I'm like I don't want to be I'm not going to throw any names up I'm like, maybe she's just a bitch you know maybe she's an unfriendly and not personable and not wanting to be around well I mean without saying any names if you're thinking about the person you, you're talking about yeah she is she was and was and people have to understand I've said this many times about these lawsuits they should go and talk to makeup artists because actors for some reason believe that when you close a makeup door that it's this holy chapel where everything you say is completely uh, you know is, is, is not, it's like the code of the road or something but you get to see when an actor comes in at 4 o'clock in the morning tired uh, you get to see what the real really? person yeah. is like with their needy and a pain in the ass to work with because as a makeup artist we have to just do our job we can't have an opinion, we're not allowed to say what we think, uh, you know, and it, the funny thing is we have, um, you know, sensitivity training now, and it tends to be very, um, it tends to be very, when you do this sensitivity training, it's usually like being taught in a way that men are the predators, and like men do touchy-feely on girls and all this kind of stuff, and yet personally, and I've raised this in these discussions, I've had female actresses sit on my lap, grab my crotch, you know, you know, you know, pinch my ass, and uh, if I was to do that to a female actress, uh, I'd be ripped apart. You know what I mean? But it's like, oh, it's only a bit of fun. You know yeah. what I mean? I had a situation where I had a very awkward situation with an actor, and went to a producer and complained and said this person is rude and offensive and being belligerent to people in the makeup trailer. And the producer just said, look, it's only two weeks. Just, just put up with it. And that's what it's like sometimes. They, 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 you know, some producers do not want to know. They're like, look, we just got to get through this thing. I've got, we've got a job to do. So just suck it up, man. So uh, it's, 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 I have seen some terrible, terrible things happen in making trailers and on sets and in places. On, uh, whether it's people being treated badly, being yelled at for no reason, or people being literally propositioned into things, you know, uh, casting 
cat situations. I mean, you know, that's why everyone was surprised. Like, oh, the casting couch is not what's been talked about for years. It's never gone away. It's it was it's been a thing since the the movie started, and it's going to be a thing until movies end. But everyone always assumes the casting couch. They always think, oh, it's some creepy old producer hitting on some young starlet, and yet. I've worked with male actors who say, no, it's creepy male casting agents hitting on men, you know, and saying, hey, you do me a little favour and I'll get you in the business, you know what I mean? Um, here's the, the, the odd thing is for me is that working 35 years in the industry and having directed some films, I've never had those opportunities. I think it's like, oh, you know, you know, late night visits to the jacuzzi and stuff like that. I never saw any of that sort of thing. I mean, maybe I was just working too bloody hard, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Didn't have time. Yeah, I mean, if you're making a low budget film, you've really got to kind of kick ass and get the job done, so you don't have time to, you've got to get home and, this, this is the what people don't understand about directing a movie, as opposed to being a makeup artist. You do a makeup on somebody, you go in at seven o'clock in the morning, you glue it on their face, you peel it off at nine o'clock at night, and that's it, you go home and you, you eat some food and drink a beer and then go to bed. As a director, when you finish at nine o'clock at night, you're usually thinking, what did I get? What didn't I get today? What did I miss? Oh my God! Did I do that right? Uh, that scene wasn't very good, was it? Like I really wish I could go back and do that. Why? Right, what do I need tomorrow? Oh my God! It's such a big day to do tomorrow. Uh, okay, so I need to work out what I'm doing. Oh my God! It's four in the morning. I'm up in three hours' time. You know what I mean? You, you are just on the boil for the whole thing, and um, it's it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And then then you get to sit in the edit room six weeks later and go, Oh God! You just go. Get a shot of me like. I didn't get that one close up. Can we cut around that? Can we cut around? It's it's brutal, man. And and, and I found it even on high budget shows, you miss something or you don't get it. Look, she was on big budget film. You can go back and shoot it. But on a low budget film, you're kind of screwed. You're done. Your 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 14 days or whatever you got is done. Which is why now I'm absolutely manic when I direct. I'm like uh, I stay. Look, I like to chat and I like to get involved in conversations, but I won't leave the director's chair on set when I'm in between shots. I actually stay on set, no matter what I want to do. If I see some nice wardrobe, cute wardrobe girl who's paying attention to me, she's like, can I have a little chat? I'm like, no, I must stay here must stay right. and watch the set and make sure, because this 20 minute set, it might turn into a 30 minute set up and, and then I've lost 10 minutes. So it's, it's, it's hard, it's, it's very hard, you gotta stay really, really focused. Yeah, and, and uh, now you, with the age of, of going from film to digital, did you ever, did you just go from film to digital or did you just go digital, just, how, I, when, when, you, when you were directing? Uh, no, first films I shot were on film, um, and, and even when I did um, a film with Danny Roebuck, um, we did a, a children's film, Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, we actually did mixed media because we found that we wanted to shoot a lot of, uh, I wanted a lot of in-camera work, flash framing, and bus framing, and uh, trigger jumping, mm -hmm. and you can't do that with video cameras, so we actually shot on video, on, on high depth, but then we used a Super 16 for certain sequences, which looked very similar. Um, no, digital's great. I mean, it makes complete sense. I mean, the, the film, I did, there was a point in time where if you were doing a low budget film, I was like, maybe we should do it on film because it tends to look high, higher quality. Mm. It has a luster to it. Video can look a bit clean and a bit squeaky. Yeah. And um, without having the time to really light it or to play with it in post, it can look a bit, a bit jarring. Um, not to throw stones, but I think a lot of the reason people perhaps are trashing on the monsters trailer is because it looks very digital and over clean and a bit, a bit, a bit synthetic. Whereas uh, film tends to have this lustrous quality to it. So it, it, there was a time when it would help on, uh, uh, you know, to shoot a lower budget film and film. But the reality is, is that digital is getting better and better and better every day. So I mean, there are going to be filters. It's going to be like in the music industry when. You know, 30 years ago you were using, you had to use certain amplifiers for sound. Yeah. And now you just have programs that do it. I think there'll be a thing probably in a few years, thing where you have a setting on your on your on your camera, and it's like it's like it'll be Bolex so and so, you know, it'll be whatever the name of the camera was, you know, being an Ariflex 402 or so and so, and you'll just flick through them, you know, and you have to, like it'll change the settings now. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, even the, the editing software that I have to edit my shows and stuff like that. Oh no, absolutely. It, it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah, dude. It's it's. I can, I'm like, people go, oh, I'm gonna make it look like VHS, I wanna make it look like Super 8, I wanna make it look like, you know. No, and I think, uh, you know, there was a, a reason for shooting things because you knew they are gonna go on, on a cinema. But I think the world of cinema has drastically changed. Yeah. I don't think cinemas are gonna be around ever in the way they were pre pandemic. No, no. And I've been saying this for years, I think cinema is gonna turn into a two model, um, 
go-to model situation. It's either going to be super high budget where you go and spend eighty dollars a ticket and you have dinner and drinks and you watch a movie and it's an experience and mm -hmm. bell hops and you know it's yeah, yeah, really yeah. quiet. Or it's going to be a three dollar ticket where you can go in and literally throw popcorn around and take videos all day long and you'll send your kids to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it'd be a freaking riot where you have to hose the place down at the end of the day. Because people will just start to naturally make their own decision. I think they do it already, but any time a film gets advertised as a trailer, you have a barometer in your head that goes, oh, I'll go and see that at the cinema. Oh, I'll wait for that to stream. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll wait for that to stream. I'll wait for that to stream. Oh, I'll see that in the cinema. And there's a very a very fine line, I mean, to get. Most people are like, most people now, it's not like, you know, in the 1970s when you had a 12-inch Sony Trinitron, most people now have got a 70-inch super duper surround sound yeah, definitely. cinema chair, double cup holder. It's like, why would I want a fucking I have to go and get a park car and get a babysitter and then have and then there's a possibility because it happens, everyone's got the possibility that the one time you go to the cinema, there's some jackass in front of you going you know, or chatting, or someone's girlfriend saying, can you go get me a burger? You know, or some idiot going, I don't know, I think he's the guy who came in earlier on. You know, you were Or some jackass, you, know, you go see Texas Chainsaw 17, and they decide to bring their two-year-old. Oh, shit. Me and my wife, this is what we love talking about. We went and seen Event Horizon. Yeah. That and, family film, right? Yeah, because these people brought their little kid. The kid is screaming and crying the entire day. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, take your kid out of the... Th it's the only time where we're like, go! Get out of the movie. They said, are you scared? He went, no, it's still like, no, this is movies. <laughs> this is the only... I'm crying because it's the last good film we'll make. <laughs> so, oh, I'm just thinking he's going to make Death Race. <laughs> That's why I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to his career? That's what the kid's crying, really. Uh, How many Resident Evil movies could he make? Oh, he's dying. Yeah, that grew up Now we've got Resident Evil, uh, Welcome to Raccoon City, that everybody hated, that I liked. I'm not going to lie. Um, okay. I had, I had to ask uh, Mike over there. Okay, so when you got you got Fangoria, did you guys get the VHS tapes over there, like yeah. the screen the screen grades and all oh, that no, stuff? Like, it? well, I had to get kind of like you know imported versions of them and then watch them on a uh, uh, a, uh, a transfer. Yeah, so with the screen grade Savini, I mean, I wore that thing out, you know, and I knew the dialogue of that. And sometimes I think that's it. My little case, and I go places and I kill people. <laughs> I knew it would for freaking work. Oh man, absolutely. That thing was like a, oh, um, you know, it was like the like greatest thing ever. Uh, when you're talking about growing up in the middle of nowhere, you know, I, I grew up middle of nowhere, Ohio, whatever. And it's funny because I found out like Kevin Yeager lived like 30 minutes down the road. All right. And I'm like, well, what? What? The, the, the guy and, and Jeff and yeah. Jeff Yeager and Chris and I'm like holy shit the whole Yeager family and, uh, <laughs> and then I of course then I dissected how that was literally my, one of my school projects is we figured out how they made Chucky yeah. oh right okay so we built we built like the hands I thought you said your, your project was to dissect Kevin Yeager <laughs> I wish you had yeah. <laughs> I would pay that to happen now <laughs> Uh, no, uh, Chucky's incredible, especially some of the stuff they did for Chucky 2 was amazing, incredible. Uh, Dave Nelson and the guys who did all the next on that, phenomenal stuff. I still think that uh, digging the grave shots is something fantastic for tearing, it really, really is. They, uh, they raise the bar on that. Really what's, your, what's your work that you've done that you're most proud of? Or do you have one? Uh, you, what's really weird is the silly little gags that you do in films that uh, no one would ever would know about, and you're like, I'm so proud of that. Like you get an award for something that's garbage, and you're like, but the thing I did there was really good. Um, <clears throat> doing the kill on um, on Gone Girl, uh, I was proud of because you were working for David Fincher, and David's you know uh, can be an intense guy to work for, and suffers full gladly. Full gladly. So if you could if you could do a gag for David. Have him at the end of the day say, "Hey man, you did you did some good work today. Um, you know, you you know you've kind of stepped up to the plate a little bit. So um, yeah, I think there's some good work in Sleep Hollow. I was very glad for the stuff I did in Blade. And again, like Stephen Norrington, like uh, David, is a an intense force to work with. Steve will push you to the limits. And a lot of people I feel hated. I've known Stephen for years, and I know what you know what you're getting into. It's like don't." If you're going to go tornado hunting, make sure that you're going to wear some clothes that, you know, be, be aware of what you're going into. Uh, you know, you can't be thin-skinned on work for Stephen Norrington. Stephen Norrington is very, 
or was very kind of like, look, I'm going to run a marathon and I expect you to run beside me. Run beside me. And if you're going to be 60 feet behind me, I'm going to yell at you and scream at you and say, hey, I thought you were going to run a marathon. You can't be like, oh, I can't run very fast. That's not going to work. So that, I think some of the Hellraiser that we did for the money is phenomenal. You know, when you look at Hellraiser Judgment, I know that the effects budget was about $22,000. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, what Mike and the guys did on you know, Revelations, a film that is absolutely torn apart and ripped apart, and it should be. It's a bad, bad film. But makeup effects-wise, and I know people don't like the pinhead makeup, but the pinhead makeup looks bad because of the person it's on. Mm-hmm. It's nothing to do with the makeup. They cast a guy who physically did not have a good shaped head. The makeup was quite by Richard Redlison, for God's sake. Richard Redlison's like an a Oscar-nominated make, make, makeup for doing bombshell and stuff like that, you know. He's a brilliant makeup artist who worked for us. And the effects budget on the whole of the makeup effects budget for Hellraiser Revelations was $7,000. $7,000, and that includes on-set work. So, I mean, that's making Pinhead and the uh, pseudo Cenobite and making the costumes and the boxes and then doing all of the gore effects and a skinned guy, for Christ's sake, for $7,000. They were working... I mean, I was on. I was doing Scream Four in Michigan at the time. These guys were like literally sleeping in the workshop uh, because they wanted to try and do a good job. Our resident we had, we had like, I'd say, twenty thousand dollars to do a new pin in it costume, uh, Chatterer, Simon, the two sick twins, the auditor, and then we made all the props: the skin guy on the table, the butcher, the surgeon. That's why people are like, oh man, the surgeon's just like a girl in like a cat suit with a gas mask. It's like, I had no fucking money. <laughs> I ran out of money. I had no money at that time. You know, or, or you know, they, you know, it's like nudity, girls, you know, clothes. If you if you're on a super low budget show, do you go with a cheap shitty costume, or go, you know what, we'll just have them take their clothes off? Because it's immediate production value. And I didn't. I mean, I I'm not particularly a fan of nudity. It's hard. I say it's uncomfortable. Yeah. People get dirty, but I would never do. We've no situation where those girls have full nudity. They were wearing underwear, yeah. so they're only topless, and they agreed to it. And we tried to cover them in blood. The idea in that sequence, if you saw a judgment, yeah. was that I wanted to create this paradox where you see this beautiful body that is a man you're attracted to, but then you've got a girl whose face is torn off. So it's like, are you still attractive? Are you still finding this attractive? Would you? Could you? If you if you wanted to, the idea was you go. It would literally like having a man's head on a woman's body that you go, whoa, like, you know, we've all been in a situation right where you see some some girl with long hair and she's walking along and you stare at her butt and go, well, she's cute. And it turns around and it's a guy and you go, oh, oh, but, oh I didn't realise. Well, it's you know, a pretty good ass, you know. I don't know, about, you know, what was I thinking, you know. So it was that, you know. It wasn't just like, oh, tits for hits, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. meant to be a, um, a, to twist your brain that you would go, oh, and I'm freaked out by this, you know, like, I'm, I was sexually attracted. That's why I pan up to them. They would pan up and see them. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that whole thing reminds me of the uh, Italian movie Conquest. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, the, with the woman's got the skull face, and she's got that really hot body through the entire movie, and then, yeah. Well, because Barker always used to do this thing of, like, you know, what's beautifully grotesque. And that's what we were trying to do with beautiful grotesque. And that's why it's tried to make the audience feel like a. He's the genetic series almost. But also with the Urza that he's what's going on with him is that he's he's disgusting I think obviously got, he's got lacerations all over his face. But you're still interested and engaged with him. He's not just a, you know so gratuitous that you can't you have to look away. He's just enough that you're okay, I'm interested in this guy is not curious. You know, like the most common question I get asked is what's behind his eyes? Does he have eyes? Is there no eye sockets or what is it? It's like no no. no. And you don't want to know, really. It's like a magician showing you the trick. You, you don't you want to do see the trick. Know, but if you took his glasses off, it would ruin it. It's like Michael Myers taking his freaking mask off in Halloween Kills. It's like, what a dumb idea. You don't take Michael's mask off. I don't want to see he's got a beard or he's got grey hair. I don't, I don't want to know what's under there. I mean, I do, but I don't. All I want to know is that underneath there are the devil's eyes, the blackest eyes. You know, that's all I want to know. That's. I think that's one of the things that worked great with like the old leather face, because all you see was his teeth. Yeah. And the, and he saw the, the, yeah, and the it, king of the lips and all yeah. that. Yeah, but you don't want to know in reality. You don't want to chase them like underneath. It's, you know, they look fantastic as they are. It's like they're, they're, they're iconic for a reason. I think it weakens a character when you make them human. Yeah, it's, it's, as a comic book fan, I, that's why I hate it when they, they humanize the Joker. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I gotta got ask, if you could be, if you could do one, if you could work on one movie you haven't worked on yet, what movie, what, what franchise really would you tell? A really well paid one? A really well paid one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a really, really well paid one. 
Uh, I'd rather work on a film that became the next franchise, to be quite honest. I kind of, I'm lucky enough that I've worked on everything I wanted to do. I wanted to work on Hellboy's movies, and I did, for good or for bad. I mean, and, you know, every time they handed us a Hellboy script, I was like, God, I hope this is amazing, and maybe it will be. And there were times I was on a film set, on a Hellboy's set, going, this is going to be great. And on times I was on a Hellboy's set, thinking, this is going to be dog shit. And it's painful. It's painful working on a film, a franchise that you love thinking it's not going to work out. Um, same with Exorcist at the beginning. I was a huge Exorcist fan and felt that Exorcist 2 was awful. Loved Exorcist 3. 3. Yes. Loved it. Felt it was just a gem that was just never seen the light of day properly. Um, and was really hoping that we'd have a crack at it with Eyes of Four. But it, and I had a great time on that film and Rennie was amazing. got to say, Rennie Harlan was not miserable. But I'd rather work on something that... Um, that became a the next franchise. I'd love to get a script where you read it and you go, oh my god, this this done right will be absolutely amazing. And there'll be part two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then um, then a particular franchise that I'd love to work on. Because you always think I don't want to work on the sequel, I want to work on the first. You know, I'd like to have worked on the reason. There's a reason it became a franchise because that one was so great. Yeah. I mean, I never did a Freddy movie. I think that's probably one of the ones that, if I could go back in time, I'd love to have maybe done like, a Dream Warriors. You know, I thought Dream Warriors was the best Freddy sequel ever. Yep. I still go back to watch it and think it's great fun. My, my son, me and him, he's just turned 23 and it's his favourite. Well, it's great, and it's yeah. kind of it's, a, it's such a it's such a saving movie because you know from his revenge is garbage. You know what I mean? It's it was weird, bat shit crazy, oh, yeah. weird, bat shit crazy movie. And then Dream Warriors came back, and uh, not only but everything about it seemed right. From the music, the song, the Dokken song, to the hallucinogenic stuff in it, the dream, the makeup effects was on point. Everyone's makeup effects on it were were great, you know, and, uh, and kind of poor as well. Like, kind of, Carried it on, and after that, he kind of lost his way a little bit. So, uh, yeah, is that kind of an answer? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. What, 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 what would you, what do you think? Is there a sequel that you, uh, you know, franchise that you'd like to work on? Um, I, I would love to do an alien. Really? See, I just think it's been killed. No, so that's what I'd want to do with it. Yeah, so I would love to try to bring it back. I think it's gone too far down the mines, like Terminator. Someone called me tomorrow and said, Dude, we're doing a new Terminator, and we've got $100 million. I'd be like, Leave it, guys. Like, just, just let it let it go. And it's the same with Aliens. I think it's been, they've tried to make war movies, they've tried to make psychological. You had Ridley do all of his Ridley stuff, and it's like, find something new. Like, even on Hellraiser Judgment, and maybe I'll get yelled at saying this, but my mantra on set was like, Look, let's. Let's innovate, not replicate. Mm -hmm. And I think just I'd rather see more of that is people just the next movie that everyone goes, oh, this is fantastic. And those movies do come out. I mean, there are movies that come out every couple of years that people are like, I mean, I want to see Barbarian. I want to see Barbarian. Yeah, yeah I want to see Barbarian. It's really cool. And, uh, and when Babadook came out, people were like, and again, polar, horror polarizes are always new polarizes. And Aliens really isn't a horror film, it's more of an action movie. Yeah. You know, because it's camera and the helmet. And that's the key sometimes, it's like, don't, you know, take a horror movie and then maybe turn it into something else and, uh, you know, make it more wide screen. Um, yeah, I mean, if there was a franchise I'd like to work on, I'd like to have continued working on Hellraiser. I'd like to have been given an opportunity to have a reasonable budget. I'm not talking a crazy budget, but I'd love to have had a million More than $7,000. And do a, do a sequel to, uh, to Judgment. And we were going to do it, but unfortunately, um, the Harvey Weinstein, Case for that company down to the ground with it. My hopes and aspirations of doing a always a judgment scene. Now, you, the auditor you cre that was created for that movie, that your creation, yeah. correct? Yeah. Do you have the rights to that? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Hey, give the auditor a movie, man. Yeah, but you, again, people have to realise how hard it is trying to get these things made, and sometimes film companies are like, "Do you own the rights? And uh, you know, how big is it?" And, yeah, it's popular amongst these characters, but uh, do you not have something else you can work on your own? It's, it's, it's very strange. Yeah, it's like digger, but it's like it's totally not as bad to smell. Um, yeah, I love the auditor. I'd love to bring this to the auditor, but um, I don't know. The older you get, and I'm, I'm, I'm only the right for the age of 53, it gets harder and harder and harder to, to 
do the dog and pony show and mm. to hear the BS because with the 110 movies that I've made and the seven films that I've written and directed uh, you know I've had plans meetings for films that were going to happen almost happened yeah, about financing it was right there you know like, oh we're going to do it 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 oh. I mean it's literally it's like the worst date you can ever have with a girl it's literally like you're having dinner and she's like yeah we're going upstairs I'm sick we're going upstairs I'm sick like, let's get in the elevator you're in the elevator and she's like yeah 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 and she's lifting up a dress and showing you uh, her underwear and you're like oh my god this is fantastic and you get to the hotel room and she's like we're going to do it and she lays on the bed and she's like okay take your clothes off take your clothes off and she's like starting to turn the dress and she goes I'm going to leave now and you're like what and that's what it's like working on like trying to get a movie made sometimes like you, you think it's all systems go it's going to happen and here we go and fantastic and I put the effort in and the work and I've got the script and I've been working for free on this thing and I've been doing concept art and, and, and it turns out that this millionaire from Texas who's got millions of dollars which wants to put it into money doesn't really have any money at all and it's all just the whim of somebody who thinks that they want to be in the film it's very strange yeah. or you work with a studio a big studio for six months on a project and just as you're about to get your deal they decide to fire the three guys that you uh, had and a new guy comes in and says, oh, I'm not touching any of their projects. What happened with them? It was them. I'm sorry, the pressure. I don't like it. So, okay. it's, 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 it's... What's your biggest disappointment in the, the biggest movie that you've worked on, you put them, then disappeared on you? Um, there was a film I wrote called... Um, called No Man's Land, uh, which is a, a World War I horror film that takes place in the trenches the night before Christmas. And the idea is that the day before the holiest of days comes to the holiest of nights when demons will go out. When hell's low on its tally souls, demons will go out into the killing fields and will hunt people. And a, a small battalion of German soldiers, like six of them, a small battalion of Allied war soldiers, in opposite sides of the trench, are being taken out by this demon, and they think it's them taken out, and they realise, you know, in like halfway through, that they're being taken out, and they come together for one night to try and survive the night. And you find out this tale of this thing called the Black Angel, the, the Schwarzer Angel, and uh, they, they survive for one night, and they, a couple of them do survive, uh, and that's what causes them to play football. Uh, the, the next day on the day. Why the forces come together. It's not because of Christmas, it's because they, they survived, survived the, the night, night of this, uh, this black angel. And twice I came so close where studios were like, yeah, we're going to make this and start putting together your team and it's going to happen. And literally could smell the, the smoke on set and we're looking at the building sets and everyone's like, this is a great idea, it's going to be so cool. And then, See, I don't know. You, you asked me what movie I'm, I... I wrote a script for the Blind Dead movies. All right. Uh, and I got it way into things, and they were like... One company was like, duh, we don't think that's a you know, franchise that we... You know, and other funds was like, what's your budget? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just wrote a script. I have no idea yeah, after that. Weird. I'm afraid that's actually a red flag, really, in this industry. Yeah. If someone says that, because they shouldn't ask you. It's not for you to tell you. say, I'm a writer. I don't yeah. know. So, you know, it's like... Hire somebody, hire a, yeah. hire a, uh, a language user, he'll break it down and tell you. It's not an expensive thing to do. There are language users out there, they just say, like, send me a script and they'll go through and go, this is a $3 million film or a $5 million film or it's $3 million below the line, yeah. which is what it's going to cost to shoot this for six weeks. And then above the line, if you cast an actor at a million dollars, add a million. If you decide to cast Tom Cruise, add 30 million, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's flexible, but the nuts and bolts of makeup, hair, camera, blah, 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 is roughly three million for a six-week shoot, you know what I mean? Depending on where you're going to shoot it. You have to be a rocket scientist. So anyone who turns around and says, oh, you know, we want to make this film, how much do you need? It's like, why are you asking me? Me, yeah, I just wrote it. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Bring in somebody else. And if they don't pursue that, then clearly they're not legitimate. Right? Yeah. I'm afraid that, uh, I think a lot of people who go, oh, I was on the edge of getting a film deal, and I go, I don't think you're as close as you think. No, I, see, I was like, I didn't, I've never had anybody ask that. Just people like, ah, well, we're we'll pass on that. But, you know, it's not what we're doing. Enough, yeah, How I've do had people that. tell you they like their script usually around anywhere else? It's a bit like um, a girlfriend asking you if she's fat. Do yeah, you know what I mean? uh, that's a nice are, thing to say. Most people are like, uh, oh, do you like my script? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great. Awesome. Do you want to yeah. buy it? No. Yeah, we like the option. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a. I'm afraid it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Usually, what you want is someone to go. We read your script. I mean, I had it very recently. I had it very recently. 
I had the night, the best, the best couple of words you can ever get off a producer. It's very simple. I don't mess around. There's no foreplay, and they don't. There's no kind of let's deal. They said the very best thing you could possibly say. I had a pitch meeting, and at the end of the pitch, I'm doing my pitch, you know, elevator pitch or you know, high concept pitch, and the producer just literally where goes. Have you told anyone else's story? And I went, no, and he went, no one else has heard it. Your agent, no other studio. And I went, no, and he went, send it to us now. Don't send it to anyone else. And that's what you want to hear. That's, and that was HBO. That was HBO. And you don't want to, that's what you want. You know, you, you don't, that's, that's like going to a girl and saying, you know, would you like to go on a date? And the girl just says, yeah, Paul, not, uh, well, well, yeah. I'm seeing my friends tomorrow night, or and then the next night I'm going out with my family. You, you, you want, yeah, yeah. You want the definite yes number. or the definite no? Yeah. yeah. But that was the best. That's the best answer you could get, which is literally you haven't shown this to anyone else. else. Yeah. Has anyone bought this? Have you registered? It? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That just quiet, competitive look where they're kind of rolling around in their head. Yeah. First move I ever pitched to a studio that got made within the rock. I'm doing the whole thing. I'm in, a, I'm in a, an office with Barbara Javits and me and Robert Patrick, the Terminator, are in there. And I'm doing the whole thing and she's going, she's listening and she's listening. And then she said the most magical phrase. She went, this is going to be really cool. And it wasn't, this could be really cool. This is going to be. This might be really cool. She went, this is going to be really cool. And I just went, and I just thought, shut up, Gary, while you're ahead. And I went, because I, as you can probably tell, I did. The boat. <laughs> and I just went and she went yeah this is going to be really cool and then she t- took her eyes off me and looked at my producer and went let's uh, let's move forward on this and I was like and then we did that stupid thing where you literally we all went out to the office went to the bathroom and literally high five and yes. took a friend in the bathroom like idiots <laughs> and on that situation six months later we were on set Nice. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, $1.2 million when I was 27, shooting in, uh, you know, Toluca Lake with Robert Patrick as my producer. Heck yeah. Best story I can tell about that is um, Robert, at the time when I met Robert when we were doing the film, he was uh, shooting striptease with Demi Moore. Yeah. So he had long hair and a beard, it was kind of scruffy looking. He didn't look like the Robert Patrick. Patrick you know? yeah. And I'd been seeing him Robert every day. He had an office and Detroit every day. And then uh, a couple of days went by. And I went to open the door one day and Robert came to the door. And what I didn't realise is they were about to shoot Terminator to the right. Right, yeah, to uh, yeah. time or it was called. And he'd literally just had his hair cut and shaved and been styled into the Terminator. And I opened the door and he was just came to the door and it was like holy shit it's the Terminator <laughs> I mean and you don't realise how iconic that look is until you're face to face with it and I was like Jesus Christ and he's like and Bob was like yeah it's pretty intimidating and I was like dude it's amazing and I was like wow and I went so do it and he went you see this boy and I was like oh that's fucking great you know uh, and he was like hey nice boy I was like that's great I was like, <laughs> I just went home like on a high. I was like, like, I got to meet Terminator too. I just got to fucking get the Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> like kick ass, of uh, But uh, you told me you were in a band. Oh yeah, I was in several. <laughs> what was your band's name? Uh, first one band I was in was called uh, Nova. Then I was in a band called Saber. Then I was in a band called Elite. Then I was in a band called The Dark. Uh, and I've always wanted to be in a band called Cupid with a bazooka. Cupid. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of bands. Uh, punk, rock? Oh, heavy metal. Heavy yeah. metal, yes. I was a rock singer. Yeah. Rock. Still am, still, I still record. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. It's a burrito out, that's nice. Um, I, uh, yeah, I still record vocals for, uh, I do a lot of sound like vocals. I got a very 80s rock voice, you know. Very Sebastian back kind of voice I have. Uh, uh, without the attitude, uh, you know. And the big cock. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, uh, I have that kind of role. Some would say dated, I guess, but, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's what's, what's hot again. All that stuff's coming back again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can do a pretty cracking rendition of Dream Warriors. And, uh, you know, that that's, but that's one of my ranges, so uh, yeah, I have a pretty comfortable uh, singing in a range. Uh, classic rock music. 
I just seen Dokken two years ago, uh, Sebastian Bach a year ago. Or Don, Don call me. They should call me. He, uh, he actually did pretty Don, good. Don call me. He actually did pretty good, I think. He did? He come out in the first... They, they, they chewed down. The first song, it, it was like he wasn't really into it. And then, like, the second song, he started getting into it. By the third song, he was really... He warmed up. Really yeah. Cool. And it, he, he did good, because it was... I just uh, texted Faith, you know, the playback state said to me, you pitched that they're, they're singing, like, it's a lot lower tones. They're, they're, they're kicked down several... He's not singing the original. Uh, no. The original one. Which is a shame, because I was like, whoa, whoa. You know, it's a lot lower than it should be. But uh, Sebastian still still there and remain. Um, those are hard songs to sing, you know, alone. Um, I remember you, so... I've done it several times. So it's I, I, I saw the uh, uh, Slave to the Grind Tour in 1991, and I saw the Slave to the Grind Tour uh, 2021. <laughs> it's, it's the 30 year more. I'm a huge male fan even now. I, there's lots of bands. I mean, I've been pushing Ghost for a few years now. Powerful for a band. I'm really, really into it. Love Powerful. Uh, I still look for classic stuff, but I'm sorry, but I think there are bands who just need to knock it on the head. They really are. I adore the Scorpions. The class name is just worn out. And those guys should just stop. They should have stopped five years ago, and they're starting to ruin their yeah. rep. It's Judas Priest. They need to stop and go home. It's like, I get it. The guys go out with a little dignity. It's like uh, Rob's voice. Even Rob's voice now, the fucking brilliant Rob Halford, he's starting to crumble a little bit. And it's, it's heartbreaking to me. And guys who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, early 60s, Tinting their hair jet black and their eyebrows are jet black and their beards jet black, so they've got, they've got two giant, you know, black. You know, and going on stage in spandex pants and got it. It's like, do it with some goddamn taste. I saw Europe on stage the other day and it was like, those guys are at least doing it properly. You know? Like they look decent. They're not wearing stupid '80s clothes. It's like bands that I love. I can't. I can't. I feel like I can't support them and say, and say oh, I love this band because they look like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> and yeah, there's some great stuff. They, they look like, like they look Dead like Daisies. Glenn Hughes is rocking with Dead Daisies right now. And um, but it's like Robin McCauley of uh, you know Michael Schenker. It's like Robin, for God's sake, just get a stylist and lose all the chains and the biker jacket and the, and the over tinting of the black hair. It's like for God's sake. They look like the big saying this bright bleached one hair, white hair. What an asshole! <laughs> I, I think they look like the dads of the guys they who do. originally they look like Dad bands, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like there's a cool way of doing it. I mean, like I, I know the guys in Leopard, but even Leopard are a bit overdressed. It's like pull it back a little bit. You know, if you can't walk down the street in it, then you shouldn't be wearing it. No. No. If you're only wearing pants, you can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm a I'm a metal guy from from from. It's like back. Kiss. But, you know, like, oh. I loved Kiss. I loved Kiss. I've seen them a bunch of times. But Paul is lip syncing now. He really, really is. And Gene isn't, and I, it's great. Gene isn't. But it's like, guys, you know, this end of the road, how long is this road? Fuck it. This is the longest road I've ever seen. And I'm, it's great people are showing up. But most people are showing up because they're tourists. Do you know what I mean? They're tourists. They're not fans. I went, I went and seen Ozzy's No More Tour Tour in 1992. <laughs> Truth is, it's not Ozzy who wants to do no, it. No, he's, he's jabbed in the back with a stick by Sharon. They got, they got get, his, on stage, get on stage, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, let the man sleep. You don't need any more plastic surgery, Sharon. Die. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, stop for the love of... Let the man just rest now, you know? When COVID hit, I thought, oh, they're going to retire. He's, he's done. He's got Parkinson's. COVID hit. Everything. The, it was a farewell tour. I, I was going to go see the farewell tour, take my kid, because I went to see Slayer's film where farewell tour with my kid. And uh, and uh, that, I think I think Slayer went out on top. That last album was great. They weren't out there. The ones who did the best, I've got to say, I'll give them credit until the very end, Rush. They didn't even announce it. They did a tour, and all it was was a bunch of fans we were all like, I don't think they're going to tour again. I think this is going to be the end. We all kind of figured it out. We all kind of knew. And they didn't announce it. They didn't try and fleece you for any more money or bring you people. It's like, look, we're and you kind of figured it out much yourself, and everyone turned up in droves. Yeah, now, now you got getting lead tour on the premise, though. Yeah, but it's not rush. No, no. He no. really wants to practice. Yeah. He wants to practice. That's great. Alex Life's a new band. He's uh, a band of great. I love their, their new single. Like, that's fantastic. Great. But they should, just because Neil's died, they should stop making music. Yeah. But, they, but they've got, they won't, they won't get, um, John Petrucci and start, you know, or, you know, or like some great drummer and like start 
Because I knew they were talking with somebody said they were trying to get Mike Portnoy. No, to, no, they won't. They won't. No. No, I would never believe that in a million years. It's completely. I, I will say to my death that I don't care who said that. It's a fucking thing. There's no way they get it. They said, oh, let's get Mike Portnoy and we'll, we'll replace Neil Pitt. It wouldn't yeah. happen in a million years. Yeah. Those guys are way. They literally, after the death of his wife, were like, that's the end of the band. Yep. They didn't turn around and say, oh, well, Neil's taking his basketball ball tour with another drummer. No. No. They don't need the money, and they've got no. the respect, and they are straight up guys. If anybody is just more nice as them, Big the beings on the planet, it is rough. I, I was lucky enough to see them uh, on one of, uh, oddly enough, one, not one of their greatest albums. I saw them on Roll the Bones tour back in the, in the early 90s. Great show. And, uh, one of the best shows. Ghost of the Chance on that album, that's a great song. Yeah. Ghost of the Chance is a fantastic song. Oh, yeah. And Roll the Bones is a good song. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I was I was like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm fresh out of high school, went to Rush, and I think that was my graduation. Did you get Rush 5? Huh? Did you get Rush 5? Yes. That was my that was my that was my graduation present. That's was cool. was tickets to go see Rush. So, uh, all right. Um, before we go, I guess uh, any upcoming projects? I know you're semi retired. Yeah, no, uh, I did. Um, I did. I worked for a guy called Vincent Van Dyke. He's a brilliant young makeup effects artist, and he did a film uh, called Dark Harvest, which is by David Slade, who did um, Thirty Days of Night. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, it's a cool uh, period movie shot in you know, Toronto, Canada, for quite a lot of this character that was sort of and I that character entirely, and I find it as a very cool looking character. Um, I still do the effects for one director, Patrick Lucier, who did um, I believe on uh, uh, yep. I've done all Patrick's trick, um, and he just did a film, which is called Play Dead, uh, yeah. with Jerry O'Connor and Lady yeah. Madison. And we made it, and everyone's like, it's really good. And then the studio cut it, and they were like, <laughs> so now that we're yeah. it, that it, and then Bailey got pretty yeah. for liars like to be out. So Bailey started and they're like, yeah, no. So let's hold on to it and they're very excited about this film. I haven't seen it yet, but everyone who's seen it comes to me and goes, it's good. So um excited to see what happens with that, so that's called Play Dead. And then Patrick he's got two more films that he's been doing in the next six months. One called Camera called Black Box, both horror, both very different, both very cool scripts. And hopefully I'll be on those. So um, nice. If Patrick does a film, no matter what, uh, I will always look for him. He's the greatest director friend on the planet. I will walk through fire and he comes and asks me and I usually end up doing props for him. I will act in those movies occasionally. Uh, uh, yeah, he's just, uh, I, I can't say more good things about him. Nice, nice. Well, and he was the editor on the screen and stuff like that. Was, uh, he should have probably directed the last screen. Patrick Lucier is, uh, that guy should be making Marvel movies. He should have been fantastic. Now, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, the, the, the guy that goes from directing Hellraiser to directing Doctor Strange. Oh, well, I mean, I think when you say it like that, it sounds very weird. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, Scott... Uh, I think the Exorcism of Emily Rose is absolutely yeah, that's from this. Yeah. Uh, Scott's a really smart guy. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And the fact that he did, you know, he didn't go from Hellraiser to Inferno to directing Mark. Yeah. He went from Hellraiser to directing Emily Rose and to uh, one of the Black Houses. Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, wherever yeah. they are, pretty PG-13 movies, you know, it's very successful. One of those that I don't really give them. Careful. <laughs> um, you know, but also, you have to realise as well, Scott and his writing partner, if they did that work, they probably did a lot of ghostwriting on the projects as well. Uh, so it makes makes complete sense that they would uh, put Scott with it there. I think it's a terrible shame that we got to see Scott literally lose his job on camera. Uh, I mean, and if, ever, if you don't believe me, guys, go back and watch the conference where Kevin Feige was announcing. Doctor Strange 2 and Scott Derry says yeah we're going to make a really scary the first ever scary Marvel film and Kevin Feige goes it's not going to be that scary it's not going to be a horror film yeah that's scary elements and Scott's like and it's like ah, there goes your job and literally they hired Sam Raimi all the way later but I'm sure Scott will bounce back and do something 
Brilliant director. Very clever guy, very, very intelligent man. Maybe we'll go, maybe we'll go to uh, Paul James to go work for DC and put uh, one of DC's horror guys to, to work. Whatever Scott does, I'm sure he'd like to get Scott to get the guy. I was going to, again, that's going to be the worst thing David Hurst's film, which is a big budget film, yeah. so showed that he's got knowledge of how to work with the large big actors and all that. That's really what it comes down to with these certain studios. They want to see that you can ship, that you can work on different levels and all the 60 day shoots with large talent. Oh, cool. Yeah, got to go So, yeah, no, I was thrilled. Uh, just as Andy didn't call me and ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand why he didn't, because honestly, um, whilst I worked my ass off on the Hellraiser and Inferno, I, I suspect he was probably not. Uh, 100% happy with everything, but I was compromised by finances. So I'm sorry. Sorry if you didn't like everything I did, but uh, I love what you've done. So I say, I still think Exorcism and Emily Rose is a film I'm still watching now. The idea of courtroom drama that's horror film. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I loved it. My, my wife was the one that talked me into going to see it. She loves courtroom dramas. And I was like, oh, it's a horror movie courtroom drama. Men, the greatest. I mean, who the idea is like, let's do a few good men, but as a horror film, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, sir, I greatly appreciate you being on the show. I greatly I appreciate do. me being on the show. Too, yeah. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. And, uh, to the guests of your, uh, your podcast, uh, thank you very much. And long may it continue. Yeah. Uh, can you tell uh, people to watch the Group Therapy TV podcast? Can I tell people to watch the Group Therapy podcast? Yes. People, you should all watch the Group Therapy podcast and get your therapy on. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome.